Well, good morning and welcome. It's a pleasure to gather with you this morning for this wonderful event, a lecture by the President of the World Bank, Dr. Jim Young Kim. It's also a privilege to welcome all of our distinguished guests here this morning. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge Raj Shah, the Administrator of USAID. Thank you for joining us this morning. The World Bank's mission is an extraordinary one, working for a world free of poverty. This is a bold and hopeful vision for our world, one that carries in it a calling for each one of us. How can we envision the end of poverty? What role can we play as individuals, communities, institutions, and nations to make this vision a reality? It is fitting that Dr. Kim has chosen a university to provide the venue for this address. The ethos of the university, the characteristic spirit of the academy, is to seek the betterment of humankind. For us here at Georgetown, we seek to honor this spirit. The words inscribed on the wall behind me in Latin, ad maiorum de gloriam inque hominum salutem, for the greater glory of God and the betterment of humankind. Capture our understanding of this spirit. We are guided here by this mission to work for our collective betterment, to have the courage to imagine a more just world and to have the strength of discernment to determine the very best, most effective path toward this vision. Today we are honored to welcome Dr. Kim and to listen to his vision of the work that he and the World Bank are engaged to accomplish this very goal, to reduce poverty and to support human development around our world. We'll hear his assessment of that work, of how far we've come and how far we have to go. As we contemplate this here today, I'd like to identify just another passage on another wall toward the back that you might see as you're leaving. This one's from Solon, the Athenian statesman and poet, and it reads, keep the end in view. Keep the end in view. I believe these are important words to keep in mind as we look ahead to a vision as bold as the one we discussed today, a vision of a just world, one in which each of our sisters and brothers has the freedom and resources not to simply survive, but to flourish. This is a vision in which we can find our grounding, our commitment, our hope, and it is a vision, as Dr. King, Kim suggests, that is within our grasp. It is truly a pleasure and a privilege to welcome Dr. Kim today. He's been a global leader in international development throughout his career. He became the 12th president of the World Bank last July after having served as president of Dartmouth College. Before that, he was a leading scholar at Harvard working at the intersection of medicine and human rights. He has served as director of the HIV AIDS department at the World Health Organization. And in 1987, he co-founded Partners in Health, which today, more than a quarter century later, is a preeminent public health organization working in poor communities on four continents. It's an honor for me to be with you all today and to introduce to you the president of the World Bank, Dr. Jim Young Kim. Uh, th th thanks so much. Thanks so much for being here. Um, Thank you, Dean Lancaster, for having us. Um, Dean Lancaster, of course, has made her own enormous contributions to global development. And I want to say, uh, for the record, to everybody here at Georgetown University, you are very lucky to have here uh, one of the very finest university presidents in the entire world, Jack DeJoya, my good friend. Uh, when I was in the role at Dartmouth, we did a lot of plotting and scheming together to uh, make uh, our universities more um, uh, responsive to the uh, social exigencies uh, all around us. So it's always a great pleasure to visit an academic institution, one so engaged in developing tomorrow's leaders. I'm here today to talk to you about the future. 
about the opportunity to create a world free from the stain of poverty and economic exclusion. My message to you is that such a world is within our reach. But if we are to succeed, we have to make some hard decisions to change the way we work together. To understand the historic opportunity in front of us, what we must do to transform history, let me begin with some observation in the global development scene today and the outlook for the medium term. Let me start by noting that the crisis which has gripped the global economy over the last four and a half years does not yet show signs of abatement. So many green shoots have sprouted and withered in the last year or two. We should be cautious in assessing the future. As recent events in Cyprus demonstrate, it's really too early to declare victory. At the same time, there's growing evidence that we are on the right track, although there are sure to be some bumps in the road ahead. Market conditions in Europe have improved since the turbulence of last spring and summer, thanks to the commitment by European leaders to contain financial volatility Many risk indicators are back at levels last seen in early 2010, before concerns about euro area fiscal sustainability had emerged. While European policymakers deserve credit for these improvements, it's important for us to recognize that the injection of liquidity only buys us time. It does not solve the problem. Many more difficult decisions pertaining to fiscal and banking policies remain. And let me stress the human face of this crisis and the need to restart growth in order to help millions of families. Today, we learned that the overall unemployment rate in the Eurozone is 12%. This means that people don't have jobs and are suffering today. In Spain, 50% of people under the age of 25 are unemployed. They are suffering, and many have lost hope. Now, in the real economy, there are some weak signals that recovery is underway. In high-income countries, headwinds from uh, fiscal consolidation continue to drag on growth, but we may have turned a corner. Here in the U.S., both the housing market and labor market are improving. Over one million jobs have been added to the American economy in the last six months. Though we must note that there remains a lingering uncertainty over the deadlock over fiscal policy. In Europe, GDP is projected to shrink by 0.2 percent this year, and some of the difficulties will persist until 2014 and into early 2015. When we look at the economic picture ahead for developing countries, the prospects are brighter. The economies of the developing world are expected to expand by 5.5 percent this year, and we forecast that growth will further accelerate to 5.7 percent and 5.8 percent in 2014 and 2015, respectively. Dynamic and competitive firms are opening and expanding all over the developing world, from small startups to multinational corporations. I was recently in Chengdu, China, where I met an entrepreneur, a woman named Zhang Yan. A few years back, she had big dreams to build a business but lacked access to finance, and they were barely making it on her husband's income from driving a taxi. She was able to secure a $10,000 loan through a local bank's initiative to finance female entrepreneurs, a program supported by the International Finance Corporation, the World Bank's private sector arm. Zhang used her loan to open a car repair shop, and today she runs a thriving business that employs more than 150 people. In fact, I just received an email from her over the weekend. She plans to open a third repair shop and will continue, as she promised me, to promote social responsibility by hiring and training women who have previously not had access to good jobs. Her story mirrors the experiences of millions of ambitious individuals across the globe. When they're given the chance to succeed in business, they seize it. In turn, they create jobs and opportunities for their neighbors. This private sector growth is reaping impressive development gains, especially when coupled with more effective pro-poor interventions on the part of governments, international donors, and civil society. Today, extreme poverty is in retreat. 
1990, 43% of the developing world lived on less than $1.25 a day. In 2010, 20 years later, we estimate that the global poverty rate has dropped to 21%. The first Millennium Development Goal to have extreme poverty was achieved five years ahead of time. And the advances in the social sector are perhaps even more remarkable. In the last decade, 8 million AIDS patients have received antiretroviral therapy. The annual number of malaria deaths has dropped by 75%. The total number of out-of-school children has fallen by over 40%. Looking ahead, we believe the conditions are in place for continued strong performance in developing countries. Yet we can't take high growth rates for granted. Maintaining growth of six, let alone the seven or eight percent many economies achieved during the pre-crisis boom period will require sustained reform efforts. For example, countries must continue to improve the quality of education, governance, and the business climate modernize their infrastructure, ensure food and energy security, and enhance financial intermediation. Moreover, new risks are emerging. In particular, we are concerned that unless the world takes bold action now, a disastrously warming planet threatens to reverse much of the progress we have experienced. Climate change is not just an environmental challenge. It's a fundamental threat to economic development and the fight against poverty. According to a recent World Bank report, if we don't act now to curb dangerous emissions, by the end of this century, the average global temperature will increase by four degrees Celsius, or more than seven degrees Fahrenheit. In a four degree world, sea levels would rise by as much as one and a half meters, putting more than 360 million city dwellers at risk. Drought-affected areas would increase from 15% of global cropland to around 44% with Sub-Saharan Africa especially hard hit. Extreme weather events would occur with devastating frequency, with untold costs in lives and dollars. And it is the poor, those least responsible for climate change and least able to afford adaptation, who will suffer the most. A second crucial challenge for the medium term is the problem of inequality. Often, the mention of inequality causes embarrassed silence. We have to break the taboo of silence on this difficult but critically important issue. Even if rapid economic expansion in the developing world continues, that doesn't mean that everyone will automatically benefit from the development process. Assuring that growth is inclusive is both a moral imperative and a crucial condition for sustained economic development. We know that despite the dramatic successes of the last decade, there are still around 1.3 billion people living in extreme poverty, 870 million who go hungry every day, and 6.9 children under five dying every year. So what conclusions can we draw from this overview of today's global uh, development landscape? I believe there are two key implications for the work of the World Bank Group. The first is that now is the time to commit to end extreme poverty. We're in an auspicious moment in history when the successes of past decades and an increasingly favorable economic outlook combine to give developing countries a chance for the first time ever to end extreme poverty within a generation. Our duty now must be to ensure that these favorable circumstances are matched with clarity of purpose and resolute action to realize this historic opportunity. We know the end of poverty will not come easily. In the years ahead, as we push toward this goal, the job will become tougher and tougher because, hope, because those remaining in poverty will be the hardest to reach. Some live in densely populated areas in emerging economies, such as the Indian state, of Uttar Pradesh, which I visited last month, and which itself accounts for 8% of the people in the world living in extreme poverty. People in Uttar Pradesh need so much, including improved infrastructure, stronger education systems that prepare students for the workforce, and especially greater inclusion of women and other vulnerable groups in the labor market. Others who remain trapped in poverty live in countries caught 
in cycles of conflict and fragility. A substantial and growing share of poor people live in fragile or conflict-affected states, where both the need for and the obstacles to development tend to be the greatest. Fragile states must be front and center in any agenda to end extreme poverty. Development in fragile states is difficult, but with creative approaches, real progress is possible, as I saw in Afghanistan three weeks ago. For example, we're helping train Afghan volunteers to use GPS-enabled smartphones with built-in cameras to monitor irrigation projects in their communities, increasing their sense of ownership. Their photos and reports are now transmitted daily to our main offices in Kabul. The cameras also have a function that James Bond would have appreciated, a delete all data button, including photos and reports, in case the workers are questioned at a checkpoint. In Afghanistan, despite enduring security challenges in an environment plagued by corruption, many companies today are exploring investment opportunities in mining, energy, and transportation. The international airport is full of commercial aircraft, a striking change from a decade ago, and 27% of the country's members of parliament are women, an even sharper break with the past. The donor community's experience in Afghanistan illustrates the high risks of operating in fragile states. But increasingly, we're seeing how coordinated efforts from the international community and local governments can produce transformative results. We're accumulating, accumulating lessons on how to achieve security, political stability, and economic development. Next month, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and I will visit the Great Lakes region in East Africa together as we cooperate to put these lessons more widely into practice. I want to be clear. I have worked in fragile and conflict-affected states for most of my adult life, and uh, I will continue to strengthen the World Bank Group's uh, work in these countries. This will be one of my very top priorities. In addition to accelerating the end of extreme poverty, I believe the second development lesson for our times is that fighting extreme poverty is not enough. We must collectively work to help vulnerable people everywhere lift themselves well above the poverty line. At the World Bank Group, this focus on equity is central to our mission of boosting shared prosperity. What I've heard time and again over the past few months from forward-looking policymakers around the world is that they are concerned about inequality and exclusion. They want to create economic opportunities for, the, for their vulnerable citizens and bring growth to the homes of the poor and the relatively disadvantaged, whether they live on a dollar a day, two dollars a day, or even ten dollars a day. They want to help those who have only recently escaped ex extreme poverty secure the resources they need to join the middle class. And they want to ensure that the gains they've achieved over the past decades are sustainable socially, fiscally, and environmentally. In Tunisia last January, I met with civil society leaders who were at the forefront of the movement that launched the Arab Spring. Their message was clear. If prosperity is not shared, if it is not built on a development process which involves all members of society, especially women and young people, then tensions may again rise to the breaking point. I also strongly believe that prosperity must be shared not only among individuals, communities, and nations, but with future generations. If we do not act to curb climate change immediately, we will leave our children and grandchildren with an unrecognizable planet. The World Bank Group is now working on a revamped strategy to significantly strengthen our climate change interventions and help catalyze urgent action among global partners on the scale required. We're exploring a number of bold ideas, including new mechanisms to support and connect carbon markets, uh, politically feasible plans to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies, increased investments in climate-smart agriculture, and partnerships to build clean cities. We're reviewing our work in every sector to ensure that all our projects reflect the pressing need to tackle climate change. A four-degree world can still be avoided if we develop a plan and take concerted, act, concerted action which is equal to the challenge we face. To date, I believe our efforts to uh, combat climate change have been, overly, uh, uh, have been too narrowly focused, too small in scale, and uncoordinated. We can do better. 
Let me now talk more specifically about how the World Bank Group is mobilizing to seize the opportunity to end extreme poverty and boost shared prosperity. We're into introducing two goals to guide our strategy. These are not goals which the World Bank Group will itself achieve. They are goals which our partners, our 188 member countries, will achieve with the support of the entire global development community. The first goal is to end extreme poverty by 2030. With the end of extreme poverty within our grasp, we want to set an aggressive timeline to focus our efforts and maintain a sense of urgency. The date of 2030 is extremely ambitious. If anyone doubts it, consider that the first Millennium Development Goal was to have absolute poverty over a period of 25 years. To reach the 2030 goal, we have to have global poverty once, then half it again, and then nearly have it a third time, all in less than one generation. If countries can achieve this, then absolute poverty will be brought down below 3%. Our economists set the goal line here because below 3%, the nature of the poverty challenge will change fundamentally in most parts of the world. The focus will shift from broad structural match, uh, measures to, tackle sporadic, to tackling sporadic poverty among specific vulnerable groups. Our, excuse me, our team believes three factors will be necessary to achieve this extraordinary result. First, to reach our goal, we require an acceleration of the growth rates observed over the past 15 years, and in particular, sustained high growth in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Second, it will require efforts to enhance inclusiveness and curb inequality, and ensure that growth translates into poverty reduction, most importantly through job creation. And third, it will require that potential shocks, such as climate disasters or new food, fuel, or financial crisis, be averted or mitigated. Reaching these, reach, reaching these goals also will require additional resources. This year, the World Bank Group is discussing with our partners the replenishment of the International Development Association, or IDA, our fund for the 81 poorest countries. With IDA's help, hundreds of millions of people have escaped extreme poverty. Securing a strong IDA replenishment is one of my highest priorities. Meeting this 2030 goal will require extraordinary effort. But is there anyone, anywhere, who doubts that the reward will be worth it? Is there anyone who has lived on less than $1.25 a day who would not join me here today in telling you that it's time to end extreme poverty? Is there anyone who has seen the shanty towns of Johannesburg or Addis Ababa or Dhaka or Lima who would not commit to help a better life for all who live there? Is there anyone here today who would not want to erase this stain from our collective conscience? But we know that ending poverty is not enough. We must also work to boost the incomes of the poorest 40% of the population in each country. Focusing on the bottom 40% captures the twin elements of shared prosperity, the imperative for economic growth matched with a strong concern for equity. It demands that we worry not just about whether developing economies are expanding, but look directly at whether the welfare of the poorest segment of society is improving. It's an important objective for all countries. Though our efforts are especially focused on the countries with the fewest resources, our work is not just in poor countries. Our work is in any country where there are poor people. This is hard work, but it can be done. I was just in Brazil where I saw how carefully crafted public policies can dramatically reduce income inequality. Brazil has expanded access to education and implemented a conditional cash transfer program that raises incomes among the very poorest. Other countries can adapt these and other proven strategies to tackle inequality in their own contexts. Success can spread. The World, Grand, the World Bank Group will be there to help countries end poverty and boost shared prosperity in at least four ways. First, we'll use these goals to help us choose among competing priorities as we identify which projects, uh, where, uh, which are the projects in which we can have the greatest impact. These goals will significantly inform our country partnership strategies, the detailed policy documents which define our objectives for each of our partner countries. For example, next week we will send to the board a new country partnership strategy for India, the first strategy that's designed with these two goals in mind. 
India's contribution to ending global poverty could be staggering. In the last five years, roughly 50 million people have been lifted out of poverty in India. But in the next generation, we estimate that with a concerted push, an additional 300 million people in India could escape extreme poverty. Second, we will closely monitor and observe progress towards these goals of ending poverty and boosting shared prosperity, and we'll report annually on what's been achieved and where gaps remain. Third, we'll use our convening and advocacy power to continually remind policymakers and the international community what it will take to realize these goals. Recently, a number of courageous politicians have committed to ending poverty in their countries, including Dilma Rousseff in Brazil, Joyce Banda in Malawi, President Barack Obama uh, here in the United States, and the uh, United Kingdom Prime Minister David Cameron. All have endorsed this vision of ending extreme global poverty. These bold calls demand action. And one leader who's spoken out forcefully about meeting these goals here with us today. Uh, the administration, the, excuse me, the administrator for the U.S. Agency for International Development, Raj Shah. Raj, thank you for your leadership on this effort. We've been working very closely together, and we are looking forward to shaking things up even more. The World Bank Group will be a relentless advocate and loyal partner in encouraging policymakers to follow through on their promises to the poor. Finally, we'll work with our partners to share knowledge on solutions to end poverty and promote shared posterity. To reach the development goals, uh, countries will need sound policies and adequate financing but they'll also need to improve delivery, how they implement policies on the ground to get results. Increasingly, countries are looking to the World Bank Group for support in tackling delivery challenges. They tell us they have record numbers of children in school, but tests show that far too many can't read or write by the fifth grade. They tell us plans for new sanitation plants or new roads or new bridges have been approved, but years later, they're still not completed. These are delivery failures and for many countries are the greatest obstacle to development progress. That's why we're working with countries and partners to develop what we're calling a science of delivery for development. As it matures, this new field will provide frontline development practitioners with knowledge, tools, and support networks. It will connect them to peers around the world who can help them problem solve in real time. One recent example, engineers modernizing power grids in the Republic of Georgia received advice from colleagues in Chile who had solved similar challenges. By systematically enabling these connections, the science of delivery will multiply the impact of problem solvers uh, around the world, both inside and outside the World Bank Group. These are the people who are on the front lines figuring out ways to bring solar power to a half million Mongolian nomads, or helping Costa Rican villagers rebuild after an earthquake, or crafting a finance package that can bring a struggling railroad line in East Africa back to life. In advancing the emerging field of delivery science, we will help our partners learn from one another and maximize the impact of every dollar spent to end poverty and boost shared prosperity. In closing, let me note that this Friday marks 1,000 days until the end of 2015, the deadline for achieving all eight Millennium Development Goals. Progress on the MDGs has been impressive, but remains uneven across populations and countries. We have to use these next 1,000 days to move with much greater urgency to improve the lives of children and their families. While we ramp up, we must also focus on what comes next and how we can maintain an unrelenting focus for the years ahead. With our partners, the World Bank Group is engaged in framing a bold, post-2015 agenda. In fact, this weekend, I'll be in Madrid meeting with the leaders of all the United Nations agencies under the leadership of Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. We will focus specifically on how we can work together as a multilateral system to accelerate progress in these last 1,000 days. We will focus specifically on three countries in Africa, but we'll focus more broadly on how the whole system can work more effectively together. But we all know the challenges in front of us are enormous, and progress is never inevitable. I'm reminded of this when I think back to a moment during the African-American Civil Rights Movement 
exactly 50 years ago this month. In April 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King was arrested in Birmingham, Alabama, for leading a wave of mass protests designed to force local authorities to speed up desegregation. Many moderate white religious leaders, people who consider themselves allies of the civil rights struggle, disapproved of what they called Dr. King's extremist tactics. The day of Dr. King's arrest, a group of moderate clergymen published a letter in the Birmingham News in which they argued that all thoughtful people knew that African Americans would eventually gain their rights, eventually. But that King had acted in ways that were unwise and untimely in, uh, in trying to force change before the time was ripe. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, Dr. King responded that the attitude of the white moderates reflected a tragic misconception that time would inevitably bring progress. King wrote, and I quote, human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men and women. Injustice will not vanish inevitably. Injustice, said Dr. King, must be rooted out by strong, persistent, and determined action, spurred by the urgency of the moment. As we set goals for our organization, goals for collective effort to better serve the poor and vulnerable, we should reflect on Dr. King's example. We set goals precisely because nothing is inevitable. We set goals to challenge external obstacles, but also to defy our own inertia. We set goals to keep ourselves alert to the urgency of the moment, to push constantly beyond our own limits. We set goals to keep ourselves from falling into either fatalism or complacency, both deadly enemies of the poor. We set goals so that every day, every hour, we can ensure that our actions are aligned with our deepest values, those we can aff affirm without shame before the judgment of history. If we act today, if we work relentlessly toward these goals of ending extreme poverty and boosting shared prosperity, we have the opportunity to create a world for our children, which is defined not by stark inequities, but by soaring opportunities, a sustainable world where all households have access to clean energy, a world where everyone has enough to eat, a world where no one dies from preventable diseases, a world free of poverty. It's a world we all want for ourselves, for our children, for our grandchildren, and all future generations. As Dr. King said, the time is always ripe to do right. The opportunity is squarely in front of us. We can and we must seize the arc of history and bend it toward justice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Kim has given us a very inspirational and wide-ranging presentation and put a lot of issues on the table. At his request and with our very strong support, we would like to give students a chance to ask any questions or make any comments that you might like. There is a microphone right here in the middle of the corridor. Please line up. Uh, we have about 15 minutes or so for questions. And when you do ask a question, Please uh, say your name and where you're from. So, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for speaking here today. My name is um, Alden LeClaire. I'm a sophomore uh, in the School of Foreign Service here at Georgetown. I was wondering if you could talk um, more specifically about the strategies that development groups like the World Bank can use to combat poverty in countries racked with conflict or countries under autocratic regimes. How exactly? Can you combat poverty in countries like, say, North Korea, where you have leaders that won't work with international organizations, or countries like Somalia, where there's barely a government with which to work? Uh, thanks very much for that question. First of all, um, you know, my, um, my, both my mother and father came from North Korea. 
and the, the developments, um, uh, recent developments are extremely concerning, especially to, be, to me. And uh, the situation of poverty there is just um, um, uh, uh, one that we, we are very concerned about. But they're not a member of the World Bank Group, so unfortunately we, we can't work in North Korea. Uh, but we're watching very carefully. Um, more generally, though, uh, what we found is that uh, although every fragile and conflict-affected state is different, uh, we found that there are similarities across these, uh, uh, these states that, um, uh, uh, that, that are um, understandable. And so, for example, in Nairobi, Kenya, we actually have a, um, a hub which is focused specifically on helping fragile and conflict-affected states. And I met with that group. And it turns out that there are um, people within the bank who, who, as their specialty, work in these areas. Every country is different, but what we found is that um, as part of what we're calling the science of delivery, there are specialists who are much more effective at getting things done in, in these places. So what we're trying to do is, in contexts where there is uh, um, uh, you know, regimes that, uh, that, that you've called autocratic uh, uh, or uh, corruption, uh, our mission is still to do everything we can to provide basic services, food, education, health care, also jobs and economic growth to the poor people of those countries. So we do our best to work with every single country. What we're learning, though, is that there are some lessons that are arising from you know, uh, decades of work in fragile and conflict-affected states that we must bring together. I think before, uh, uh, if you were a World Bank staff member who'd been around for a long time and knew everybody, you could just make phone calls and get all the people you needed to come um, uh, you know, to wherever you were working. But what we're doing now is we're trying to bring, make this much more systematic so that anybody working in a fragile or conflict-affected state can call the hub in Nairobi and get very focused, uh, uh, very experienced help uh, uh, in, a, in a kind of time frame where we can make the biggest difference. We, we feel that working in these countries is going to be one of our real specialties, and uh, we're looking forward to developing the science of delivery uh, even more over time. Hi, I'm Michael Gravius. I'm a sophomore in the School of Business. Um, I know you spoke about how you're working with various companies and governments and everything on fighting poverty, but I was wondering, I guess, what suggestions you would have for the younger generation, you know, for the people who will in the future probably be running all these organizations but yet ha are not? Yeah, you, you know, um, uh, somebody asked me, um, it, was a, it was actually, I was meeting with a group of high school students, and uh, they asked me a great question. They said, in the last 20 years, What's the one uh, opinion that you had or understanding that you had that's changed the most? And the one, one uh, uh, my answer was, was immediate, it was the importance of the private sector. So I was just in India. They have a $1 trillion infrastructure deficit over the next five years. And the, both the prime minister and the minister of finance told me, and probably 53% of it is going to be uh, 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 tackled with public funds, but 47% has to come from the private sector. So uh, one of the great strengths of the World Bank Group is we have a private sector arm. We also have MIGA, the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, that provides political insurance for companies, for example, that are investing in, in, in countries. We feel that if we work together across um, uh, public, private, and even providing guarantees, we can make a huge difference. What that means for you is that, who knows, the, uh, it, you know, I gave you the, the data. Um, the the uh, high-income countries are going to grow at about 1.23 percent next year, whereas the developing uh, uh, country economies are going to grow at 5.5 percent. So the growth opportunities for business are in the developing countries. And when countries like India say, we have a trillion dollar deficit, half of it has to be made up through private sector investments, I think that spells opportunity for people like you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Dr. Kim. Thank you for coming to speak with us today. My name is Sam Kelp Gautam, a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service here. And during your speech, you talked a lot about cooperation among donors. And I actually wanted to talk to you about the 2005 Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness. And as of 2010, only one out of 13 indicators have been met. And while partner countries did a good job of taking ownership of their own development goals, uh, we haven't really seen this cooperation and alignment by donors. So I was wondering how you see that changing in the next couple of years and possibly what the World Bank may do to increase that alignment and cooperation. Well, let me just give you a very concrete example. Um, um, Administrator Rod Shaw and I uh, have now already done two sessions where we just said, look, we've got to send a very strong message to our teams that we expect and we'll help them work more effectively together. So um, 
The first session we did was on health care in four countries. And we brought the USAID and World Bank teams working on health in those four countries and sat them at a big table. And Raj and I sat across from each other. And we sat there and said, OK, what have been your successes? Where have you been failing? And what can we do sitting right here at this table to make it easier for you to work together? And then uh, more recently, we did another session on agriculture. And it was amazing. They were doing problem solving, sitting right there at the table. One group had actually solved a problem that the other group uh, was facing. They, ex they exchanged information. And, and, and uh, Raj and I were able to take decisions right there that helped them work more effectively together. I'm going to uh, Madrid. And this was something I suggested to the Secretary General. We have meetings every six months where all the heads of UN agencies get together. And they're, they're, they're great meetings. But what I said to, to uh, the Secretary General is, um, I uh, would like to turn those meetings into work sessions where we do the same thing, where we sit and say, what's going on, for example, in these three countries around the issue of uh, achieving the MDGs? And if there are obstacles that are being created by our agencies, we'll make decisions right there to remove them. Right? So all this, you know, the, 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 Paris, um, uh, the Paris principles were exactly right. But often, you have to find the right chemistry between people to make it happen. I have a very close relationship with the Secretary General. I've known many of the uh, uh, heads of uh, UN agencies for, for, for years. And what I am seeing is a, uh, uh, an altogether new and exciting commitment to finally making it work on the ground. Now, we can, we can be very friendly with each other, but unless it <clears throat> translates into the field, it's difficult. So uh, Raj and I, for example, we've been picking issues in countries randomly. So nobody in the world knows which countries will be next and which issues will be next, which means that for everybody, uh, the message is clear, and we think it's beginning to have an impact. Yeah. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for coming. My name is Angela. I'm a graduate student at Georgetown Public Policy Institute. I'm from China. And I truly love the story, the Chinese lady story you just mentioned. And a matter of fact, I have very strong passion in social entrepreneurship and uh, innovation. So my question for you is that, uh, do you think it's a time for the World Bank to put more resources into the development of private sector? And what kind of programs is the bank implementing right now to make it happen? Well, the, the private sector work of the World Bank has been growing very, very quickly. And so now it's a third of our overall portfolio. And what we know is that when the World Bank works as a group together, for example, in Myanmar, where right now um, uh, uh, IDA, the, the, our concessional loan window, IFC and MIGA, all three are working together uh, to build an uh, integrated energy platform that I think is just going to have tremendous uh, um, uh, impact. We are, th this is the great unique strength of the World Bank Group. You know, we have concessional loans, we have uh, loans to, develop, to middle income developing countries, we have private sector, we have guarantees. If we can get those three working together, I think we can have a tremendous impact. And also, you know, as I said, the one thing that's changed for me over the last 20 years is, uh, is uh, just this uh, profound understanding of the importance of the private sector. The China, you know, um, the Ms. Zhang Yan is a very funny story because what happened was when I went to visit her, of course, the press was there. So she became very famous uh, in, uh, in, in Sichuan province. And uh, her business has tripled since I visited her, right? Uh, so th this is the first time that I truly understand what it means to be president of the World Bank. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Hi, good morning, Dr. Kim. I'm Gabriel Toledo. I'm from Mexico. And my question is, in a couple of months, the G20 members are going to gather to discuss a lot of topics, including youth unemployment. And I was wondering what, what uh, advice would the World Bank Group give to those members? Well, we've been, um, y you, may, you may know the G20, um, uh, it's, it's one, again, another one of the fantastic perks of this job is I get to meet with the top 20 finance ministers and central bank governors almost four or five times a year. So we just met in Russia um, uh, 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 a few months ago, and we'll meet again. And so um, the, the topics that we've been talking about have been very similar. And one of them uh, has been access to financing. So uh, for poor people in poor countries, um, 
Access to, fund, to basic, basic financial services is a huge issue. People don't have a bank account. And as, uh, um, as payments become much more electronic, people need access to financial services. They also need access to long-term capital. You know, this is one of the issues that we're really focusing on, because in order for us to be successful at job creation, uh, the, the private sector companies have to have access to capital that's reliable. So this is, again, a real sweet spot of the World Bank. We're now looking and developing what we're calling uh, a global infrastructure facility, which will use both public and private sector money to invest specifically in infrastructure. Uh, our, um, our new uh, chief financial officer, Bertrand Badre, is here, and uh, he hasn't yet authorized me to talk about it, but too bad. I'm talking about it <laughs> anyway. Uh, I think it's a very exciting idea, this notion that we can, we, that we can help uh, bring together public and private resources to make the kind of investments uh, in infrastructure along with our uh, member country partners that will be required in order for the jobs to be created. So these aren't things that happen magically. We know the fundamentals. We know what, uh, what, um, uh, what we've got to do in these countries. I think it's something that the G20 finance ministers know about because they keep asking us to, to talk about access to finance as a, as a major issue. So we'll talk about it again. Yeah. Dr. Kim, I, I know you have a tight schedule. Um, I'm wondering if uh, we might just go over, how, how are we doing? Let's keep going. Okay, fine. These, I, I'd really these, like questions, to, these questions are great, by the but way. But I'd really like to end yeah. with maybe the opportunity for a few people in the sure. front row to that ask would be a question. So if you just give a signal. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much for your remarks. I'm Melinda Herring, and I'm a recent grad of the Democracy and Governance Program at Georgetown. I was really heartened by your remarks about fragile states, and I was counting the number of times you said governance, and I only heard it once, and I was hoping that you'd say a little bit more about your plans for governance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, fragile states. Thank you. It's, it's a major, enormous issue. It's, um, uh, you know, let, let's also just call, call it what, what it is in many ways. Uh, the problem of corruption is real. And it's a discussion that I had very directly with the leaders in Afghanistan. It's a real issue there. Um, you know, we've gotten really good at the World Bank Group at following our money. Uh, we're really good at, at doing audits, and um, we've had a zero tolerance policy in, on corruption. I, I think for us, that's the best thing we can do. Now, the other thing we've been talking about, though, is that um, we kind of stand back. And as uh, leaders get elected, we stand back and say, so are they going to be good at governance or not? And I can tell you, you know, some of the Arab Spring countries that I visited, these were people who were really good, really smart at being, um, uh, at, at, at being activists, really good, really smart at being leaders of social movements, but not necessarily any experience at governing. So what, what we would like to do is working with a lot of our partners. I know that USAID has these programs. We would like to work with our partners to, to be a little bit more um, uh, forward leaning on saying, look, we shouldn't assume that just because you were elected, you're going to be good at governing. Just like, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm learning on the job, too, as being World Bank president. Uh, but I think if we offer the kind of support that will scratch where it itches for um, not, not be preachy, not tell people what to do, but provide the kind of support that will help them govern more effectively, we think that could work. But, you know, look, it's a huge issue. We will continue to have a zero tolerance policy on corruption. You know, we just, um, it, it, on my very first day on the job on July 1st, the question that I was asked as I walked into my office was, what are you going to do about this bridge in Bangladesh? And of course, we had to cancel it because there was evidence of corruption. Now, I hope someday we can build that bridge. It's, a, it's an extremely important bridge. But we cannot um, uh, uh, tolerate it. And we hope that that will spread um, throughout the world. Good afternoon, Dr. Kim. My name is Christopher Idibi, and I'm from Mobile, Alabama. Um, first, I would just say, like to say I'm very honored to be in your presence. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, my question is, I'm very interested in the work of the UNDP. How will the um, World Bank be working alongside the UNDP and organizations such as um, USAID in order to bring about the aspiration to end global poverty more speedily? So, um, uh, for example, uh, in Madrid, um, uh, um, uh, Helen Clark and, and uh, UNDG are going to really lead that discussion because they're the ones who um, are uh, forming the foundation for acceleration of, uh, of, um, of progress on the MDGs. So we have a very close working relationship. The UN um, um, uh, rep, uh, res reps, what, uh, residential representatives in uh, resident representatives in countries, and the World Bank uh, Group country directors are a very close relationship. And 
we're, you know, we, we have to be honest that that relationship has not been the best in every country in the world. Uh, but um, uh, with this meeting in Madrid, we're going to be sending a very, very strong message. We, ex we expect very close cooperation. Uh, UNDP is really um, uh, the Secretary General's way of leading the effort of achieving the MDGs, and we're very happy to be simply part of that process. Okay. Thank you. Maybe one more from the uh, students, and we'll then go to the other. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Kim. Um, I just wanted to quickly uh, thank you for um, making some time to come over here, and I want to thank President DeJoya for allowing such an amazing opportunity for the faculty and students. Um, my name is Edward Bay, and I'm a freshman at the uh, Nursing and Health Studies School, and I wanted to know, um, it's always been so curious to me ever since uh, President Obama elected you as the president of the World Bank, uh, as an Asian American to an Asian American, uh, what sort of, uh, or did you ever have any racial obstacles um, as you're coming along this path to your current position? And if so, what were they and how did you overcome such uh, racial obstacles? Thank you. Thank you for that. That's a, that's a very thoughtful question. And one I'm not asked very much uh, these days, but I'll tell you, you know, when I was um, growing up in Iowa, we were one of the very few uh, Asian families in all uh, of Iowa. And um, I happened to play quarterback for um, the football team. That means that when I stood up, they could see my face, right, across. Right? So in the heat of the game, um, racial epithets were thrown at me right and left. I'm one of the few people probably who um, is in this position who's ever been spit at because of their race. It happened. But look, my father was a dentist, right? My mother was a university professor. So um, race for me, uh, was buffeted enormously by the fact that, uh, that my father made a good living and my mother was highly educated. So for me, I think it's been really important to understand the difference between race and class and what it means to be truly marginalized. You know? So <clears throat> I would say that my experience of, uh, of race was very intense for a short period of time. But um, the great experience for me was going to Haiti. When I went to Haiti for the first time, they looked at me and they kept saying, blanc, blanc. Right? which means white. And, you know, it, 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 back at the Third World Center, Brown University, anybody calls me white, it's like, wait a minute, you know? <laughs> but to peasants in central Haiti, I was white. And Blanc meant a person who has access to resources. It also meant something else. It meant a person who should take the responsibility of bringing resources back here. So that, to me, was the most important lesson in, in, in race, uh, to going to places of extreme poverty and just essentially being put in your place. So you are here at one of the great, great universities in the entire world. And so what I would say is that uh, the way to get over uh, whatever discrimination you face is to think about the responsibilities you have today as a student at this great university to contribute um, to the future of children in places like Haiti. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would love to have you. So, we don't want to discriminate entirely in favor of students, uh, although we do that as much as we can. Uh, I thought we might give some of our guests an opportunity to ask a question or two. You'll have to tell sure. us how much time you have. And I thought I'd give uh, Administrator Shaw the first opportunity, but no, no necessity since uh, your name has been evoked many times already. Um, Go ahead. Uh, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but that's what I've okay, done. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks uh, for, for having me here, Jim. I appreciate it, and I'm sorry for taking up a student question moment. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think it might be helpful for all of us and, and for folks here to just hear what do you struggle with? Uh, you've been in the job now for a little bit. Uh, you've been a source of inspiration to a lot of us that are eager to partner with you. I, I suspect uh, I struggle from some of the same things. But what's tough in this role as president of the World Bank? Well, um, you know, you, know uh, you may have even heard me, Raj, at one point. But uh, at, uh, at Dartmouth, I was uh, so privileged to be president of Dartmouth. And um, I used to quote a president of Dartmouth who used to be, who was an undersecretary of state, the first undersecretary of state uh, for public relations, John Sloan Dickey. And he left the State Department here in Washington to become president of, um, of, uh, of Dartmouth. And of course, all of his friends were the leading figures of that time in uh, international relations. And he came back to Dartmouth and he said to his students in 1946, 
he said two things. He said, I want to leave you today with two things. First, that the world's troubles are your troubles. And second, I want you to know that there's nothing wrong with the world that better human beings cannot fix. So that was my mantra. All right, so now I come to the World Bank, and in fact, the world's troubles, every single one of the world's troubles are my troubles. Right? <laughs> I went from dealing, well, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, so, so this is, it's just the enormity of the task. The enormity of the task, uh, you know, one day it's one country, another day it's another country, one day it's, uh, it's gender equity, the next day it's uh, uh, access to financing for infrastructure development. Every single day it's something different, and every single project is compelling. Every single idea is compelling. We have more than 10,000 employees uh, uh, it, at the World Bank Group. They're all so smart, and they're all fantastic advocates of whatever it is that they want to do. So the difficulty is focus. The difficulty is setting priorities. That's what I'm trying to do today with this speech. In other words, ending poverty, boosting shared prosperity is pretty broad. But tell me how this is going to work. Tell me how what you want to do is actually going to help us do this. And tell me why doing it this way really builds on the strengths of the World Bank Group. Because if it's not something that we do extremely well, let's just not do it. So that's the hardest thing, just choosing between all these different uh, um, things that are so compelling. Yeah. Anybody else? Steve, let's uh, Steve. please. Uh, hey, Steve. Good to see please, you. Please uh, nice introduce you yourself, again. Steve. Uh, Steve Rattlett, a professor at the School of Foreign Service and the Global Human Development Program. Great to see you again. Um, so I want to go from the grand questions of, of race in Iowa and Haiti and, uh, and solving all the world's problems to a specific issue that you face on, on the poverty uh, challenge. You have a real tension uh, between allocating your financial and personnel resources towards need or towards uh, better governed countries that might use aid uh, effectively. The aid, aid allocation formula pushes you towards a more selective basis to allocate more funds towards countries that are doing well, that have great needs, but also have, uh, have shown a greater commitment uh, towards uh, policies and actions to reduce poverty. If you're going to, on the other hand, if you're going to meet this uh, problem of, uh, of ending extreme poverty, you're going to have to devote, we, you, the world, are going to have to devote more time and attention to DROC, to Somalia, to Sudan, countries, big countries with a lot of people in Pakistan, with a lot of people in them that don't meet that criterion for greater aid allocation. So you got a tension between need and where aid might be most effective in reducing poverty. And uh, I know you want to try to do both, but, but, and I know you've thought about this issue, but how are you thinking about that tension as you try to meet that, yeah. that goal? Um. Well, what we hope is for a really ambitious and generous Ida replenishment so that we have fewer of the really difficult choices. That's one. <laughs> Let me go on record as saying that, <laughs> Steve. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> but uh, but here's, how, here's what I would say. Um, uh, we've talked about this, and with discussions with our board, th this has been quite explicit. And they asked us some tough questions. What if we're down to below 3% poverty for the world, but there are um, uh, many countries that have 70% poverty? Well, I have to say, I would not consider that a success. So we have to have some sense that we've got to see progress in many, many countries at once. And, and, and so uh, how do we make those decisions? I, I, again, I don't think the thing to do is to say we won't work in this country or we won't work on that issue. I mean, we've done that twice in the history of the World Bank Group. We decided that we were going to get out of infrastructure and agriculture. Bad decisions at that time. But they seemed great. They seemed really smart. They seemed that they were focused on, you know, we have to, be, we have to make choices. I think what we're trying to do with setting these two goals is to say there's going to be no easy decisions. It's not going to be one country versus another country, but I'm going to ask every single vice president, uh, country director, to be specific about how uh, this investment in this country is going to help us end poverty and build um, uh, and uh, boost shared prosperity. But I have to add to that that, oh, and by the way, working in fragile and conflict affected states is going to be our specialty. We're going to be known as the group that does the best. When, uh, when, when we're working in fragile and conflict phase. I mean, it's, it's not saying that we're better than any others. We're just going to say we want to be uh, there when, um, uh, uh, when, uh, uh, when, when we're needed in these very difficult areas. This is why we're going to the Great Lakes region, uh, why uh, the Secretary General and I are going there. We want to send a message 
that the multilateral system working together, along with bilateral and other donor partners, if we come together and say, let's come up with a combined political security and economic solution for this whole region, that we can get much more bang for limited dollars if we work together. Right? So uh, it, it's not so much choosing areas or choosing countries, but a laser focus on ensuring that we use all of our resources, all of our strengths, to be optimally um, uh, transformative and effective in particular areas. It's the best I can do, Steve. You, you, as I, I was should have expected that you were going to ask me the impossible question. But <laughs> hi, Milan. How are you, Mr. President? How are you? <laughs> Thank you for your committed leadership. Uh, Milan Vervira now at the Institute on Women, Peace, and Security here at Georgetown. Uh, you have been, and as the bank has been, a great uh, articulator of the need to unlock women's economic potential, as you certainly reference here today. And as the bank has said, one of the biggest areas where this needs to be done is that missing middle, where growth and jobs creation occur, SMEs. And women confront some of the toughest hurdles in growing SMEs, building SMEs, to markets, to training, and especially to finance, which again you reference with the wonderful Shandu example. But what more can be done in that area, yes, with the private sector, but in greater collaboration, working with the innovators at IFC to really, really push this ability to access the capital that's required to unlock this potential. Well, uh, Milan, thank you. Uh, and let me go back to the, the Chengdu example, because she actually, Zhang Yan went to a bank that was a branch specifically for women. It's the first time I've seen a women's branch of a, of a bank before. And uh, it was specifically set up so that it would be easier for women to go to. The decor was different, the mood was different. It was just really quite striking to me, and it just, you know, that seems like a great innovation. Uh, and it harkens back to um, our work in Haiti years ago. We had to, to, um, uh, to build a cadre specifically of women's health workers, because the health workers that we were hiring were mostly men, and women were not getting access to the services. So I think we have to be pretty direct about focusing uh, on women's economic opportunity specifically. You know, there are other things that we have to do, and one of the things that, that I've been doing is when I go to a country, where they say to me, you know, status of women is, here is different um, because of our culture. What I say to them is, well, you know, I was born in 1959 in Korea. And in 1959 in Korea, the status of women was extremely low, maybe even lower and worse than this country. And you can fill in the blank. And you know, over time, the Koreans decided that without women in the workforce, they would not be able to grow their economy. So they did that without changing fundamental laws, like, for example, who gets the children when there's a divorce? It used to be only the men's family, and now it's different. Uh, they realized that without strong participation in the workforce and women, without participation of women, that they were not going to grow. Now, Koreans still consider themselves a Confucian society, but they have adapted Confucianism to a woman president for the first time in their history. So I don't, I'm an anthropologist, I don't buy this argument that culture prevents us from moving toward gender equality. And I will say that in every capital I go to, and I will use this example. So it's a small thing, but I think I have to keep doing it. I think we all have to keep doing it. Look, you know, this is about, this is about uh, uh, fundamentally uh, embracing equity and justice. This is not about culture. It's about equity and justice. And if we have that framework, and if we look at innovative approaches like women's uh, 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 branches of specific banks, I, I think we can make progress. But what I, what, I said, what I say to all these countries, OK, well, look, you, know, you can say as much as you want to me about your culture, but if you don't get women involved in the workforce, you are not going to grow, and you're going to have trouble. So that's our position. Thank you very much, everybody. I really appreciate it. <laughs>